Hello and welcome. Tonight, House of Representatives Minority Caucus aligns with Senate in six weeks impeachment ultimatum to the president. Deplore security situation and the state of the nation's economy. As calls to identify those whose negligence aided the Kujé jailbreak resonates, federal government says it's concerned and will sanction anyone responsible for security breaches. And Kano High Court sentences school proprietor to death by hanging for killing Hanifa Bubaka, a pupil of Noble Kids Comprehensive College. On business news tonight, Nigeria commences real-time gold trading as Lagos Commodities and Futures Exchange makes its launch to harness the country's $1 trillion commodities ecosystem. On sports news tonight, the 2022 Commonwealth Games officially begins in Birmingham as the hosts herald the multi-sports events with the opening ceremony. And from Abuja, the president orders the Niger Delta Ministry to take over the Ogoni cleanup from the Ministry of Environment and this is hinged on the slow pace of the ongoing exercise. National news from London. UK defence officials say a counter-offensive in the Ukrainian city of Kurzon is gathering pace as a major bridge is destroyed. It is not a laughable matter. That's the emphatic statement coming from the minority caucus of the House of Representatives on the threat to impeach the president issued by senators across party lines yesterday. The minority caucus today joined the Senate in giving a six-week ultimatum to the president to improve the security situation in the country or be served an impeachment notice. The House Minority Leader, Didier Lumelu, stated this at the end of a closed-door meeting with the Minority Caucus of the Senate. He also drew attention to the general state of the nation, including the exchange rate and aviation crisis. Today, our reserve is almost gone. We do not have any reserve anymore. The reserve is gone, and these were the things that it took PDP led government time to build. You know, today they tell you that Second Niger Bridge is being built. That is not true. It's under sovereign wealth fund. It's not being funded by appropriation. It's difficult to even fly. No aviation fuel. The aviation fuel is no longer available. And yet you cannot also fly by road because the kidnappers, the bandits are on the road. So having looked at all these scenarios and the reason behind why our colleagues worked out in the Senate, we're of the opinion that we'll also join them in the same way. They have given six to eight weeks for Mr. President to address the insecurity that is, of course, affecting this nation. And I want to also join on behalf of my colleagues to say that upon the expiration, we will prefer ways of ensuring that we'll gather all the signatures. And let me make it very clear, those who are thinking that it's only issue of PDP or minority caucus, no. And when the time comes, I heard somebody this morning saying that it's a laughable uh, attempt uh, to want to do that. But perhaps when the action starts, the person will be find out that it's not a laughable action. Meanwhile, tackling the challenge of insecurity requires a systemic response from relevant arms and tiers of government and not just the president. This is the view of the senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Femi Falana, while reacting to the ultimatum by federal lawmakers to President Muhammad Buhari to resolve the insecurity matter or face impeachment. Mr. Falana, who was a guest on our breakfast program, Sunrise, however, said the national insecurity calls for urgent action. There is the Nigerian Police Council. The president is only the chairman. The 36 state governors are members. And of course, in addition, the Inspector General of Police and the chairman of the Police Council. So in that body of 39 members, 36 of them are state governors. But the body never meets. It's part of the dangerous legacies of the military, whereby the president is seen as the chief security officer of the country. 
And therefore, everybody must go to, to, to the presidency. But we have repeatedly maintained that governors must share police powers with the president. That is the provision of the Constitution. In fact, by virtue of Section 216 of that Constitution, an inspector general of police cannot be arrested, um, cannot be appointed or removed without the advice of the police council. Yes. The president must consult, must consult the police council. So if we are talking about security of Nigeria now, we must take advantage of the provisions of the constitution. Staying with the security concerns, the outgoing president of the Christian Association of Nigeria, Reverend Samson Ayokunle, has berated the federal government over the recent attacks on the Presidential Guards Brigade. Speaking with reporters after the General Assembly of the Association in Abuja, Reverend Ayokunle explains that the government must restructure its security apparatus to overcome the challenges it is confronted with. The government of the day has to fasten their seat beds. <laughs> it's not a thing of play any longer. It's, in, it's not a thing. In their presence, the bandit, the terrorists are bragging, and they are implementing what they are saying. It's no longer bragging. And uh, to be denying the obvious is to be caught napping. So, the, the presidency, especially the spoke people there, should not be denying the obvious any longer. They are not talking to kids. They should fasten their seatbelts. It never happened in the history of this country that the almost the highest professional body, the presidential guards, will be attacked by terrorists who had boasted that they wanted to kidnap the president. And these are the people guiding the president. They will be attacked just like that and killed 10 of the brigade of guards. It's not, that is not uh, music at all. Over in Undo State, the police say they have commenced investigation into the attack by armed men in the late hours of yesterday on Craneberg Construction Company in Owo Town. The attack in which two persons were injured comes about seven weeks after gunmen attacked a church in the same town, killing over 40 persons. Governor Rutimia Kariadulu has visited the scene of the attack, calling for calm. According to an eyewitness, the gunmen arrived at the company's premises around 8 p.m. on Wednesday, detonated explosives and started shooting sporadically. Although Cam has since returned to Owo Town, Undo State, southwest Nigeria, the site of Krimberg Construction Company, which was attacked by gunmen the previous night, is still attracting sympathizers who woke up to the shocking news. <laughs> Information gathered from eyewitness revealed that the assailants came in the bus. The damages left behind are evident within the premises. Two members of staff who were injured during the attack are still receiving treatment at the Federal Medical Center of War. Around 8 o'clock, I say I don't know where the gunshot was coming to my back for Cranbor. That is what I was trying to say. I don't know where the people from. I don't know. I saw one person carry AK-14. I don't know what is happening. Lawrence Eragame is lucky to be alive with bullet wounds. The casualty could have been more. The head of dynamite detonated at the Krimborg Construction Company here. And uh, we were all shocked and people ran at a skater. But God so kind to us, the construction workers, there are very many here. This is their office. There are very many. But they were inside as that time due to the rain. This is a great calamity to this our company. So we can never afford it. So we are begging Nigeria to assist us. The understate police command is calling for calm while investigations are ongoing. The CP has called for calm and he has told people that we will do everything within our power to ensure that we get to the root of this issue. And once again, we are still telling our people that we all should please be active. We understand how the feel concerning what has happened. But investigation has commenced in any concerning the issue. 
Meanwhile, the Ondo State Governor, Mr. Rotimi Akeredolu, has allayed fears over the shooting at the yard of the Kremberg Construction Company. The governor who visited the construction site along with heads of security agencies and some government officials in the state urged the people not to panic. This attack on Kremberg Construction Company comes about seven weeks after gunmen invaded the St. Francis Catholic Church in a war. On Sunday, June the 5th, killing more than 40 worshippers and injuring many others. And against the backdrop of criticisms over the seeming inaction of authorities following the attack on the Kujay Correctional Center in the Federal Capital Territory, the federal government is giving assurances that the culprits will be held accountable. This is coming from the National Security Advisor, Major General Babagana Monguno, after the National Security Council meeting today presided over by President Buhari. He also touched on the recent attack on the Guards Brigade, just as he says the military is developing new strategies to combat the menace. This is the third National Security Council meeting in one month, and President Muhammad Buhari is presiding. The president summoned this latest meeting as a continuation of the previous one to discuss the technical issues and the tasks which were given to various security agencies, especially the attack on the Kujie Correctional Facility. Council is in the process of winding up the special investigative panel on the Kujie incident. And the idea is to come up with recommendations, hold those who are supposed to be held accountable for their deeds and to ensure that this type of thing never, ever, ever happens again in this country. The meeting is pertinent in view of the latest attack on the Presidential Guards Brigade in Buari in the Federal Capital Territory, which is further exacerbated by the emergency evacuation of students of the Federal Government College, Kuali. A few days ago, troops of the Guards Brigade were ambushed and decimated. Had there been a collective effort by way of just snippets of information, we might have averted that incident. I know people are weary, people are tired, people are beginning to gravitate to other places for self-help. The truth is that help is rooted in everyone working for the other person. Again, the members of the armed forces have also made a commitment that in the coming weeks, They've already started working on a new strategy to deal with these snippets of violence. On the issue of state of security in the Federal Capital Territory, the National Security Advisor refused to speak. In part two after the break, we have more on security as military assures FCT residents of adequate security plus Kano High Court sentences school proprietor to death by hanging for killing Hanifa Abubakar, a pupil of Noble Kids Comprehensive College. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channel's Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. House of Representatives Minority Caucus aligns with Senate in six weeks impeachment ultimatum to the president, deplores security situation and the state of the nation's economy. As calls to identify those whose negligence aided the Kujay jailbreak resonates, federal government says it's concerned and will sanction anyone responsible for security breaches. Kano High Court sentences school proprietor to death by hanging for killing five-year-old Hanifa Abubakar, a pupil of Noble Kids Comprehensive College. And UK defence officials say a counter-offensive in the Ukrainian city of Kherson is gathering pace as a major bridge is destroyed.
security. The defense headquarters says 30 of the terrorists who attacked troops of the Guards Brigade in Buari Area Council of the Federal Capital Territory on Sunday have been eliminated. The Director of Defense Media Operations, Major General Bernard Onyuko, says the operation was conducted by troops of 7 Guards Battalion and 167 Special Force Battalion in conjunction with the air component of Operation World Punch. General Yuko was speaking in Abuja at the bi-weekly media briefing on military operations around the country. It is the bi-weekly media briefing of the defense media operations and the latest attack on the Presidential Guards Brigade is top on the minds of journalists attending the briefing. The director, defense media operations, gives an update on the attack. Troops of 7 Guards Battalion and 1 in 7 Special Forces Battalion in conjunction with the air component of Operation Wild Punch, conducted clearance patrols around Buar general area between 24 and 26 July to successfully cleared Kau and Ido villages. Consequently, about 30 terrorists were neutralized after the bombardment and their enclaves and hideouts were destroyed. Ground troops also recovered six motorcycles two AK-47 rifles and some magazines. He then goes ahead to reel out the statistics of the successes recorded by troops in the last two weeks in the Northeast. Also in similar operations, troops on fighting patrol engaged the Boko Haram terrorists at Gwalaram village in Magumeri local government area. Also troops came in contact with terrorists along Kwang Kilakasa Road, Mongunu Gajirang, and in the ensuing firefight, one troops neutralized 20 of the insurgents. Troops further exploited the area and recovered six rifles, three bicycles, one Toyota Land Cruiser gun, gun truck, three tires, 490 rounds of 108 millimeter ammunition, 274 rounds of 7.62 millimeter NATO, metal links, magazines, and two improvised explosive device cylinders and some liters of premium motor spirits. While assuring residents of the Federal Capital Territory that the military is working to ensure adequate and effective security of the nation's capital, he urges residents to cooperate with security operatives by reporting unusual movements and persons in their neighborhood. In the meantime, the Minister of Information and Culture, al Haji Lai Mohammed, says the federal government will sanction the British Broadcasting Corporation as well as the Trust Television for airing documentaries glorifying and fueling terrorism and banditry in Nigeria. According to the minister, the government is aware of what he describes as the unprofessional documentary by the BBC Africa Eye, where interviews were granted to bandit warlords and terror gangs, thereby promoting terror in the country. He also condemned Trust TV, owned by Media Trust Limited, for using its platform to grant interviews to a bandit kingpin, Shehu Rekeb, thereby promoting the activities of terrorists. According to him, both platforms, by their actions, have become accomplices to terrorists and bandits in the name of reporting. To other stories, a political economist, Professor Pat Tomi, has been speaking on what needs to be done to get the nation's economy back on track. Speaking on our political program, Politics Today, he advises managers of the economy to focus more on stimulating production instead of consumption. It was inevitable to anybody who understands institutions and economic performance that what is happening today would happen. So it has happened. It was predicted, it was predictable, it has happened. So the question is, how do we fix it? It won't be a one-day fix. We've got to bring back confidence that we believe in markets and that these markets will work. What are the ways we do it? First of all, we have to ramp up production. We have to reduce consumption of non-essentials. And so we've got to begin to do some austerity. And government is not just, you know, don't waste this money that does not exist. How do we stimulate people to produce? How do we begin to export? In an economy that is exporting, devaluation is not 
necessarily the end of the world. It might actually be an incentive. I keep reminding people that in my time, the Japanese yen was several hundred to a dollar. And they built an export economy. And as they were, because their exchange rate was the way it was, their exports were considered cheaper abroad. And they continued to grow their export um, uh, uh, portfolio. And then, of course, their yeah, exchange rate was getting stronger and stronger. When the yen crossed 200, I still remember very clearly, became 198. There was almost a morning in Japan that the exchange rate was getting too strong. It would negatively affect their export. So the real issue here is that we are not producing, we are not exporting, and so we are hit very badly by the fact that we are so import dependent and the prices of those imports are going to go crazy, especially now that we are even so dependent on importation of food. We should have been going for a clear national security thing with food security. From the economy to the judiciary, justice has finally come for five-year-old Hanifa Abubakar as the Kano State High Court sentenced the proprietor of Noble Kids Academy and Northwest Preparatory School, Abdul Malik Tanko, to five years in prison and death by hanging. Hanifa was a pupil of Noble Kids Comprehensive College, a school located in Nasarawa local government area of the state. She was abducted, later killed by Tanko, who demanded ransom from Hanifa's parents. The Kano state government later took the case before the state high court following the arrest of the suspect alongside two others. There are about uh, five head uh, count of uh, charges. Uh, we succeeded in four. Of course, uh, we succeeded in proving uh, to the court that uh, there was kidnapping. Nipa was kidnapped by the first uh, uh, accused person, and uh, which kidnapped was known by the second uh, defendant, but he concealed it and uh, did not disclose it to the security agencies. And uh, again, uh, uh, thirdly, uh, we also uh, uh, charged them with conspiracy which also the court agreed uh, with us that the three of them conspired to kidnap uh, Hanifa. And then, of course, uh, the fourth one is an uh, attempt uh, of kidnapping that is uh, on both the uh, accused, uh, the defendants, which the court also uh, uh, convicted them on. And the fifth one, which is abatement, which was uh, what we charged uh, the third uh, defendant with, with uh, uh, we were not able to prove that. But uh, in any case, uh, with regards to the kidnapping, the concealment, the punishment for that is uh, death. And the first and second defendant were sentenced to death on, on those two uh, offenses. And then on the offense of uh, uh, conspiracy, the first defendant was given five years, while the second defendant was given, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, two years since she was convicted on. Uh, we are really happy. We are really happy because uh, uh, this has clearly shown that uh, our judiciary is still working. We have more court stories, but this time from Abuja Studios. Linda Kibwe, take it away. Hello, Millicent. We continue with legal matters. Justice Adeyemi Ajayi of the Federal Capital Territory High Court has granted the suspended Accountant General, Mr. Ahmed Idris, bail in a sum of 5 billion naira. Mr. Idris, who is being tried alongside three others for alleged fraud to the tune of 109 billion naira, is also expected to present two charities, a director and a permanent secretary in the Federal Civil Service. In the ruling, Justice Ajayi ordered that the defendants are also forbidden from travelling out of Abuja. Seven days after his arraignment, the suspended Accountant General of the Federation, Mr. Ahmed Idris, and his co-defendants have been granted bail in the sum of 5 billion naira and 2 billion naira. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? The two other defendants, Godfrey Olushegun Akindele and Mohammed Kudu Usman, were granted bail in the sum of 2 billion naira each, with two directors each as sureties in like sum. <laughs> 
Justice Adeyemi Ajayi further ordered that the defendants should not leave the federal capital territory without seeking the clearance of the court, and failure to do that would have their bail revoked. The judge further ordered that the defendants be remanded in Kujie Correctional Facility, pending when they perfect their bail conditions. Meanwhile, trial has commenced with the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission presenting its first witness. The witness, Mr. Hayatuddin Ahmed, an investigative officer with the Antigraft Agency, testified that properties allegedly belonging to Mr. Idris and Mr. Usman, the third defendants, have been traced to Abuja and Mina, the Niger state capital. The case has been adjourned to August 10th for continuation of trial. To other stories, the president is warning that sharp practices will no longer be tolerated in the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs and the Niger Delta Development Commission. President Buhari, represented by the Minister of Transport, Mr. Moazu Sambu, gave the warning at the opening ceremony of a two-day top management retreat for the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs and the NDDC at the banquet hall of the State House in Abuja. According to the president, the ministry must take over the Ogoni cleanup project from the Ministry of Environment. Our State House correspondent Kayla Megwa reports. For those that I can't, uh, Top management of the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs and the Niger Delta Development Commission are gathered here at the Banquet Hall of State House Abuja for a two-day retreat, which according to the Minister of Niger Delta Affairs is aimed at sorting out the challenges facing both organizations. This retreat is an eloquent testimony to the unflinching commitment of the federal government to meeting the development challenges of the Niger Delta region which require in part collaboration, synergy, and coordination among the agencies. President Muhammadu Buhari ordered a forensic audit of the NDDC since it was created in the year 2000. And though the report has not been made public, the commission has been plagued with scandals, and several investigations, including one done by the Senate, have revealed misappropriation and outright diversion of critical funds meant to better the lives of the people in the Niger Delta region. President Muhammadu Buhari, represented here by the Minister of Transport, Mr. Muazu Sambo, says those days of sharp practices are over. I'm prepared to give all the support required for project delivery, but be informed that I would also enforce the full weight of the law to penalize offenses such as contract splitting, contract duplication, multiple payments for same job and all related forms of sharp practices. The Honorable Minister is to mobilize all resources to fix the LMA run about to own a junction. The organic cleanup project is purely a Niger Delta issue which has lingered without meaningful progress. Hence, in order to achieve accelerated progress, the ministry is hereby mandated to, have to take it over from the Federal Ministry of Environment. And the Honorable Minister is to submit monthly progress report to my office. This retreat ultimately is to improve the living conditions of the people in the nine states of the Niger Delta. Nigeria's Niger Delta region is home to over 20 million people from over 40 different ethnic groups, and it is home to Nigeria's main source of revenue, crude oil. However, according to the World Bank, over 30 percent of its inhabitants still live below the poverty line. From the State House in Abuja, Kayla Megwa, Channels Television News. Still ahead on the news at 10, Nigeria commences real-time gold trading as Lagos Commodities and Futures Exchange makes its launch to harness the country's $1 trillion commodities. That's on Business News. Do join us again. Welcome back to the News at 10, coming to you live from Abuja. The federal government is conversing the need for an enhanced social protection policy to reduce poverty and eradicate child labor in Nigeria. According to the International Labor Organization, there are an estimated 15 million child laborers in Nigeria without access to basic education. The Minister of Labor and Employment alongside officials of the International Labour Organization, are attending this news conference 
to mark the 2022 World Day Against Child Labour in Abuja. The latest ILO social security inquiry. According to the International Labour Organization, there are an estimated 1.5 billion child labourers globally requiring urgent attention. One in every 10 child aged 5 to 17 are still engaged in child labour and progress has stalled since, 20, 20, since 2016. Without immediate action, the number of children in child labour could rise by 8.9 million by the end of this year and also due to the increased poverty and also vulnerability that many of these children and families are facing. Poverty and the lack of access to basic education as some of the identified key drivers of child labour, which participants say must be addressed. If our children are engaged at very tender age in employment, they earn peanuts. But if they go to school, gain education, they earn a lot. They bring even more value to this nation. If we can uh... Enhance our social protection, raise the performance and the answer of what we're doing, establish solid social protection floor, we shall indeed protect our children from child labor. According to the ILO, there are an estimated 15 million children under 14 years of age that are engaged in forced labour in Nigeria, a situation that some participants at this event say requires stringent laws to combat. Meanwhile, the Minister of Labour and Employment, Dr. Chris Ngigi, has also been speaking on the ongoing strike by university lecturers. He says negotiations with members of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, is on course, but urges parties to be ready to make needed sacrifices in the face of dwindling government revenue. I don't consider them again in isolation. I don't. Anybody can say anything, but I me, mean, I'm the doctor of this strike. I know what is there. I'm conciliating them together. And they are back to education now. Mala Adamu is the education, volunteered and asked for two weeks, and two weeks have been given to him. So he's talking with them. After they finish, they will come back to uh, level with the agreements reached and we'll document the agreement as collective bargaining agreements and deposit in our ministry and salaries, incomes and wages. That's what the law says. And everybody in Nigeria should be patriotic to know that we are broke as a country. That is the truth of the matter. So we must now change our old ways, all of us. Oil is not bringing in foreign exchange anymore. So the federation account sharing money is from taxes now, from custom, from FIRS. That's all from Abuja. Back to you, Millicent. Thank you, Linda. In other stories, the Art of Living Foundation Nigeria, one of the world's leading largest educational and humanitarian organizations, will host a culture festival of song, music and dance for Africa in Lagos, Nigeria. According to the director of the foundation in Nigeria, Ash K. Jane, the festival aims to build a compassionate and harmonious society by bringing the people of the world together in celebration. The event series will hold from the 19th to the 23rd first of August 2022. A compassionate and harmonious society is the dream of everyone, but in a fragmented world, the International Art of Living Foundation Nigeria is seeking to promote unity, not just in Nigeria, but in Africa, through a culture festival. First, the foundation's director in Nigeria explains the mission. 41 years, we have reached out to 156 plus countries across the globe. And the founder of Art of Living, uh, Global Peace Ambassador Gurudev Shishi Ravi Shankar, he has received numerous accolades from many countries across the world 
for his work to bring about peace uh, in conflict-torn areas. Tagged Vibrant Africa and Rising Rhythm, this culture festival is meant to be the first on the continent, bringing with it music and dance. The announcement coincides with a visit of the founder of the International Art of Living Foundation to Nigeria. I am pleased that uh, this visit comes with culture festival because culture we often think of as song and dance, but culture captures the people. The festival is expected to be an Olympic for artists as they seek to foster unity while connecting all as one global family. In what we're celebrating, you know, with the culture festival and this theme of vibrant Africa, uh, the rising rhythm is the interconnectivity. You know, we, we are this, the sum of many parts. You know, when we all come together, we have the strength, we have the power to make a change. Imagine we are able to impact the minds of just a thousand Nigerians. Then we know that the whole of Nigeria and the whole of Africa would you know, be rekindled with hope and the vibrancy that we have will not be used to conflict against itself but to actually develop itself for the future. And that's what I am all about and that's why I support this initiative. Leveraging local initiatives like I Meditate Africa and Voice of Africa, Art of Living has reached over 2.3 million Africans and united 22 African countries through peace campaigns. The foundation has been teaching happiness and youth leadership training programs in Nigeria for more than 10 years. Let's switch now to business news. Here's Anne Wilder. Hello and welcome to Business News. The Lagos Commodities and Futures Exchange has officially started real-time trading on gold for the first time in Nigeria, as well as 12 other major commodities. And this is coming after the LCFE received license from the Securities and Exchange Commission to operate at its trading floor in the country's commercial capital. At the commissioning of the exchange, the governor of the Lagos State, Babajide Sawolu, and the managing director of the LCFE, Aki Akiridiluali, also highlighted some of the significance that this development holds for the country's commodity ecosystem. History has been made with the formal commissioning of the of the uh, Lagos State, so of the Lagos Commodities and Futures Exchange, which is now being regulated by the Securities Exchange Commission which is a dedicated electronic trading of Nigerian agricultural products of solid minerals, oil and gas, and globalizing this trade through partnership with other commodities exchange around the world. But this is not all. In addition, this morning, we'll also be witnessing, more importantly, the gold spot contract series, which is valued at about 100 million pounds sterling. It's comprising gold-backed financial instruments that will be listed and traded on the Lagos Communities and Futures Exchange. What this means is that these sports contracts can be redeemed at any time for specially made gold coins at designated vaults. We will also be witnessing the launch of the first tranche of a special gold coins for which sports contracts can be redeemed, like what Aki had said. These gold coins will be known as eco gold coin. I think we've got it to a point whereby other countries in the world that, that have produced food oil, they have their own energy exchange. That is the next frontier that we're going to be moving into in the next eight months. Because we wanted to settle clearly from beginning to the stakeholders in the gold space. And we have completed that to the extent that today you will see gold that's from Nigeria in bullion form. Today, in bullion form today. And I'm very, very happy that the executive governor of Lagos, Mr. Governor, understands the implication of where gold is traded. If Lagos State becomes a hub for gold trading in Nigeria, it means Lagos State becomes a hub for gold trading in West Africa. 
Nigeria has signed a memorandum of understanding with Niger and Algeria to help build a 4,000-kilometer gas pipeline across the Sahara, which is estimated to cost $13 billion. The pipeline linking the three countries will have the capacity to supply 30 billion cubic meters of gas to Europe, which seeks to diversify its gas supply in light of the Russian action following the invasion of Ukraine. An earlier agreement had been signed in 2009 for the construction of the pipeline, but discussions then stalled. Meanwhile, Algeria's energy minister, Mohamed Arka, says the three countries will continue with talks to undertake the project as soon as possible. All right, here in Nigeria, we head to the equities market. It extended losses today for the fourth consecutive session this week, as more profit-taking activities drove the All Share Index to its lowest point in three months. Let's hear the details from Lagos. Like Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Well, equity trading on the floor of the NGX witnessed another drop in share prices as bears sustained their grip on the stock market for the eighth trading session. The All Share Index lost the 50K level to close uh, red, down about uh, 1%, over 1%, that is. I was watching that 50K level keenly to see if it would hold, but with intensity of sell offs, it was only a matter of time. Lasako Assurance uh, led the losers counter to close at 90 Cobo. We also see Cadbury and Nestle on that list. And on the top gainers list, it's uh, RT Briscoe, UPDC, uh, topping that counter. While the trio of Transco, Zenith Bank, Champs were the most traded by volume. Well, I guess the pullback is still strong in the market. Right now, as investors might be taking profit for uh, summer holidays and a host of other reasons. And that's the Stock Market Report. I'm Ladi Williams. It's back to you. That's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu. It's actually innocent. Thank you, Anne. In international news, Russian forces have carried out deadly strikes across Ukraine as they step up efforts to retake the occupied southern Kherson region. Five people were killed, 26 others injured when missiles struck the central of Kiprosinitsky, and three people died in Bakhmut in the east. Simon Pusey has more on this and other international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. UK defence officials say a Ukrainian counter-offensive in Kurzon is gathering pace. <laughs> Footage posted on social media shows a key bridge attacked by Ukraine with at least six large holes in the surface. The Antonivsky Bridge is the city of Kurzon's sole span across the river, making it much harder for Moscow's forces to operate smooth supply lines and defend land they have seized. Russian installed officials in Kurzon played down the military significance of the bridge's destruction, saying it would affect the lives of local residents but would not change the course of the war. Meanwhile, the former Russian media worker Marina Ovsianikova arrived in court in Moscow accused of discrediting the Russian army. It's after she held a poster calling Russian President Vladimir Putin a murderer during a Moscow demonstration on July the 15th. Ovsianikova gained notoriety in March after bursting into a studio of a Russian state TV channel, her then employer, to denounce Moscow's military action in Ukraine during a live news bulletin. North Korea is ready to mobilize its nuclear war deterrent, its leader Kim Jong-un has claimed. Speaking at a Korean War anniversary event, Mr. Kim added that the country was fully ready for any military confrontation with the U.S. The comments come amid concern that North Korea could be preparing a seventh nuclear test. The U.S. warned last month that Pyongyang could conduct such a test at any time. North Korea's most recent nuclear test was in 2017. However, tensions have been rising on the Korean Peninsula. In response, a spokesperson from South Korea expressed deep regret over Kim Jong-un's remarks, saying South Korea is capable of strongly and effectively responding to any provocations at any time. A war between hate and gangs, which has left hundreds dead since it flared up three weeks ago, has spread to the center of the capital, Port-au-Prince. Gang members engaged in a fierce gun battle with each other and with police on Wednesday. 
The city's temporary cathedral caught fire amid the fighting. It is not yet known how many people were killed in the latest battle, but UN figures suggest more than 200 people have died between the 8th and 17th of July. The running mate of the leading Kenyan presidential candidate, William Ruto, has lost $1.7 million after a court ruled that the money held in four accounts at a local bank came from the proceeds of corruption. Justice Esther Maynor ruled that Rigathi Gachagua received the money from government agencies, but there was no evidence that he had supplied anything. In response on Twitter, Mr. Gachagua said the judgment did not come as a surprise and was meant to undermine my candidature in the coming elections. A city of 7 million people in central China is half submerged after a month's worth of rain fell in just an hour, highlighting the vulnerability of heavily built up Chinese cities to floods. The streets of Luoyang were underwater after 100 millimeters of rain lashed down on the city within an hour, prompting the local weather bureau to issue its highest level of alert. Emergency responders were deployed to evacuate many residents, including a pregnant woman who was found trapped under a bridge. Schools and businesses were told to close, as were subway systems and underground shopping centers. Drone footage has been released, showing the effects of a more than week-long wildfire in Zamora in Spain. Scorched trees and ash-covered terrain is all that can be seen for miles on end. According to data provided by the regions, in the last week the fires had burned more than 30,000 hectares and caused thousands of people to leave their homes. In the first six months of this year, 69,859 hectares were burnt, the worst record since 2012. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thanks, Simon. Now to Victor Mathias with some sports news. Thank you, Millicent, and welcome to Sports News. Nigeria and 71 other nations were on parade this evening as Birmingham opened its Commonwealth Games in spectacular style with a captivating, hopeful ceremony at Alexander Stadium. Events beginning on Friday and more than 5,000 athletes representing 72 nations and territories across 19 sports and 280 medal events until August the 18th. Nigeria will compete with 94 athletes in nine sports and they are looking to surpass 2018 record in Gold Coast Australia where the team ended the multi-sports event with nine gold, nine silver and six bronze medals. A France centre-back, Jules Koundé, has agreed a move to Barcelona from Sevilla. Both clubs announced earlier today without giving details on the length of cost of the deal. According to the Spanish press reports, the two clubs have hammered out a deal worth 50 million euros that includes an extra 10 million euros in bonuses. It will be Barca's fit signing of the preseason after the arrivals of Robert Lewandowski from Bayern Munich, Rafinha from Leeds United, in addition to AC Milan's Frank Cassie and Chelsea's Danish central defender Andreas Christensen on free transfers. A four-time Formula One world champion Sebastian Vettel has announced that he will retire at the end of the 2022 season. The 35-year-old German, who currently drives for Aston Martin, won four successive titles from 2010 to 2013 with Red Bull. His 53 Grand Prix victories place him third on the all-time list behind Lewis Hamilton on 103 and Michael Schumacher on 91. And Henrik Stenson says that money definitely played a part in his switch to the lucrative Saudi-backed Live Golf Series. And he had hopes to retain his Ryder Cup captaincy, which he was stripped of last week. Stenson had helped Europe to victory in three of his five Ryder Cup appearances as a player. But Ryder Cup Europe says the 2016 British Open champion could no longer fulfill contractual obligations as captain after he joined Live Golf. The breakaway league has attracted many of golf's top players, including six times major winner Phil Mickelson and former world number one Dustin Johnson and Brooks Koepka, Stenson said the money on offer convinced him to join them. And that's a wrap on Sports News. I'm Victor Mathias. Thank you for watching. It's back to Millicent. Thank you, Victor. And the main news again. The House of Representatives Minority Caucus today aligned with the Senate in the six weeks impeachment ultimatum to the president. The lawmakers explained that the deplorable security situation as well as the state of the nation's economy were the reason for their action. Also, a Kano High Court today sentenced a school proprietor to death by hanging for killing Hanifa Abubakar, a five-year-old pupil of Noble Kids Comprehensive College. Thank you.
Thank you for watching. I'm Millicent Walker. Have a good night and stay safe.